मुझे वो नजर नहीं आ रहा कि इट्स लॉन्च्ड इट्स लॉन्च्ड ओके आदाब वेलकम टू द थर्ड इन आवर वेबिनार सीरीज ऑन इस्लाम आफ्टर कॉलोनियलिज्म को स्पॉन्सर्ड बाय यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ एक्सेट्रा एंड हबीब यूनिवर्सिटी um i'd like to start by once again saying something for those of you who might not have seen the uh, earlier uh, talks uh, something about our, our title islam after colonialism as the first speaker reminded us uh, islam itself the way we use the word today uh, is really an effect of colonialism ab wo bahar ke log jo honge kahenge these professors are crazy uh, what can that ever mean Uh, but in fact the way we use the word is dramatically changed uh, as people who will have paid attention to this um uh, know that islam in the quran and uh, in subsequent usage uh, was not in fact a thing koi cheez nahi thi it was not a thing uh, it was uh, more like a disposition yeah a uh, khal uh, you you could say um, so you're talking about a disposition a condition or a dispositional condition yeah uh, which implies uh, integrity wholeness and of course the most famous one is peace uh, so that itself is indicative how of what uh, a dramatic effect uh, the colonial experience actually had uh, on uh, really all aspects of our experience and uh, this uh, the religion itself of which of course islam is one uh, was uh at the heart of that yeah in the transformation of our societies as is quite really evident today uh now this also uh, islam after colonialism the after is of course also like post uh, in the post colonial uh so it's uh, on the one hand in the wake of uh colonialism yeah so uh, both it necessarily implies what happened during that period uh, but it's also a post as in a kind of hope for what might come after yeah so after in that sense uh once we have uh decolonized properly because the uh, formal decolonization uh as so many of us now know uh really uh did not change much so the, the decolonial project uh, is really before us uh rather than something that is uh in the past yeah uh so uh, that uh, that part now requires uh if we are to have any hope that requires both uh, uh, a usable past you might say yeah uh, a past that might uh, affect other potentialities in the present yeah uh, so uh, we got some of that in our second lecture with shankar nair uh, who uh, talked about the scene uh, in the uh, pre colonial period uh, in the 17th century uh, and uh, uh, showed us a very different islam once again uh that prevailed at the time yeah very very dramatically different uh from the scene today uh especially at the uh, elite or political level yeah uh, but and then the other aspect of course is what are we going to do now so uh the that's the other part that's the reparative project which is why i'm so excited uh for uh our speaker today and uh my colleague uh, dr sajad rizvi from the university of exeter will now introduce her Yeah, thank you Naman and um absolutely right um we're kind of moving on to the the decolonial part of what we were trying to do um so it's a real pleasure to um introduce um Shanila Khoja Mulji who is associate professor of gender sexuality and women's studies at Bowdoin College um and um she's quite well known in the field already she has published uh, a book a whole bunch of articles and has another book coming out the the book that she has already published which is very significant um, already in this area um is called forging the ideal educated girl and it's very much about uh what sort of uh, muslim self um gender self uh, emerged in the colonial and post colonial period um especially within this kind of rubric of what one understands as i guess civility um accepted acceptable religious civility sharafat i guess would be the 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 word in urdu uh, and uh she really is a specialist on gender which is so she doesn't just work on 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 uh, women studies um because she has a book coming out on masculinity next year 
uh, again with the University of California Press. Um, and um, that is called Sovereign Attachments, Masculinity, Muslimness and Effective Politics in Pakistan. And I'm very much looking forward to reading uh, that as well, not least because I think we do need uh, far more studies of, uh, I guess, what you might call Muslim masculinities um, in the post-colonial and perhaps even in the decolonial present. Um, so uh, that's just a few things uh, about her. Um, and as, as uh, Norman was saying, we are kind of moving to the decolonial reparative. The title of today's talk is um, Resistance and Repair, Enacting a Decolonial Praxis in Teacher Professional um, Development. And it comes out of, of some field work and uh, that she's done actually in uh, Pakistan, which uh, gives it a certain uh, relevance as well. Um, you know, we did mention this right at the beginning of the series that we're starting with South Asia. Um, and we did say that one of the reasons why we started with South Asia is that if you think of Islam and colonialism, then South Asia is one of the first areas which comes to mind immediately. Um, the other area, of course, is Egypt. Uh, and that's because of the historical contingencies that have been at place and how, um, you know, Islam and colonialism continues to be uh, very much contested within uh, these contexts of uh, the post-colonial um, South Asian context, whether it's India, Pakistan, or Bangladesh. So uh, without further ado, um, I will pass over to um, Shanila, uh, welcome Shanila, and um, she will you. speak for about half an hour. I think she has a PowerPoint. And then uh, after that, uh, Norman and I will discuss a few things with her. And for those of you who are watching this on Facebook, there will be time for you to comment and to ask questions at the end as well. So um, please, Shanila. Thank you so much, Sajjad and Aman. Um, thank you for inviting me to this series. Um, I have been following and the conversations thus far have been really generative. Um, I also think um, that the title of Islam after colonialism is also provocative because um, it calls on us to think about a past, as you mentioned, but also continue to um, think through the entanglements of the present with the past. And so um, thank you for creating this space for us to have this conversation. Um, so for our time today, um, uh, while I do work a lot on, um, uh, on gender, gender studies, I think what I'm going to do today is to um, share an experiment of sorts um, that I co-conducted with about 50 teachers in Sindh um, from a years ago, uh, like from a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the reasons is because it uh, ties in nicely with this notion of um, contemplating on the afterlife of colonialism and trying to um, think through and imagine a decolonial praxis in education. Um, and so in sharing this experiment, um, I am trying to prompt um, a broader conversation around coloniality and education. Um, let me begin um, first by clarifying that um, I believe that colonial relations have not vanished, they have not ended, um, they have simply transmuted um, from territorial occupation to new forms of control. Um, we see this in uh, new relations of domination and exploitation um, that unfold through the expansion of global capital, um, the imposition of racial and religious hierarchies, soft power exercised um, through development agencies, and of course, um, the never ending uh, imperial wars, the war on terror, namely. So we continue to live in a global system um, that organizes social life and uh, distributes epistemic material and aesthetic resources in the service of empire. Um, the effects of these colonial relationship, colonial relations are also very visible. Um, we see them in the ever increasing global gap between the rich and the poor, the widespread displacement and dispossession of the formerly colonized, um, the creation of new colonies, new refugees, um, environmental degradation, and of course, um, the marking of knowledges of the global south as inferior. Um, if, we, um, if we think about territorial colonization, um, we, uh, are, it'll be helpful for us to keep in mind that it did not simply entail economic and political control. Um, it also included cultural domination um, and an active erasure of indigenous knowledges. And so education has always been a critical technology of empire building um, and it continues to remain so. Um, in this respect, um, it's useful to be reminded um, that after the 1857 War of Independence, which the British saw as the mutiny, 
um, the uh, British sought to educate their Indian subjects in the tastes of empire um, in order to ensure that uh, future rebellions or, or uprisings do not happen. Um, they instituted um, a range of interventions um, from Zanana visitation programs, um, establishment of teacher training institutes, Victorian schools, book prizes, office of public instruction. And these were all um, elements of a broader strategy that aimed to reorient the Indian subject toward English tastes and opinions, um, as Macaulay famously said. Um, these practices established the dominance of English knowledges um, and they displaced um, prevailing, um, office, often capacious understandings of knowledge. Um, these included um, knowledges that were simply um, not something that one could acquire at will, um, but a sensibility that is also uh, tied to divine grace, right? So um, Noman talked about this notion of tajalli. So there is a sense that there is esoteric knowledge that um, we cannot simply will, it is also bestowed. Um, and so these conceptions of knowledge then were pushed to the periphery. Um, the British also articulated their ideal of um, separation of religion and state, um, delimiting religion to the space of the family and then putting men in charge of that domestic sphere. Um, colonial practices also displaced a range of um, structured as well as unstructured spaces of learning um, that existed. So um, those were from neighborhood madrasas and maktabs to individual relationships that um, one had with Malvis, Ostanis, and Pandits. Muhammad Qasim Zaman um, writes about how madrasas um, responded to the English institutions of curriculum, classes, and grading, um, the mapping of classes onto biological age um, by actually following um, similar practices in the madrasas. Um, and um, this also, of course, led um, the ulama to think about what is orthodox Islam? How do we teach it? Um, and that led to a codification of Islam as well. And in my book, I talk about how Muslim women are also thinking through um, appropriate knowledges for Muslim women. Um, this includes conversations around the balance between um, English and what they call Islami talim, Islamic education. And so I want for us to think about how some of these conversations that are happening around what is Islam so we can teach it in schools, um, what are English um, knowledges that are appropriate for women, which ones are not appropriate, um, how do we conceptualize Islami talim so that we can then teach this to men and women. All of these are questions um, that are emerging in response to some of these colonial interventions that I've just discussed. Um, and so Islam uh, gradually transforms from being an experience, um, a fluid lived experience to a, an identity or a proper noun. And Fessel Devji talked about it during the first um, session of this seminar series. And these questions, uh, we've inherited these questions and these questions linger. Um, in Pakistan, we find ourselves in a situation where uh, the educational landscape has fragmented along class lines, along um, religious versus secular versus hunar lines. Um, Islam is often viewed as a, uh, a set of doctrines and then relegated to one course, Islamia, uh, in our curriculum. Lived Islam is studied perhaps in the peripheries uh, and in the popular spaces, of course. Um, education has come to be closely tied um, to class interest. Um, it represents middle class sensibilities. Um, we observe a valorization of the English language, uh, a heavy reliance on experts from the West for policy making, curriculum development, and teacher training since independence. And so um, the, we've, we've engaged in this westward orientation. Um, which has consequences because um, it directs attention to sources of authority outside one's own society. Um, and, and ultimately what's at stake here then is the subjugation of our very thought and being. Um, I also want to um, note that by speaking of knowledges in this way, I don't mean to suggest that European and non-European knowledges are distinct or without any entanglement. Um, in fact, it is precisely through practices of silencing and erasure that epistemic privilege is acquired. Um, that's why I often find Akira's use of the metaphor ecology um, to be useful to conceptualize the field of knowledge um, because it helps us to point to 
the historical and geopolitical conditions of knowledge making, while at the same time, um, it calls on us to attend to the nexus of knowledge and power. Um, it's against um, this sort of background of our contemporary colonial situation um, that it becomes critical for scholars and practitioners alike um, to undertake both uh, resistive and reparative work. Um, decolonial praxis is, a, it names a mode of intellectual reflection and action that hopes to confront these histories and their ongoing presences. Um, and the way in which we theorize this in um, the context of our work together with teachers was um, that it seeks to first um, deconstruct dominant forms of intellectual productions to show their lineages in Eurocentric epistemologies, um, outline hierarchies that emerge as a consequence, and then pluralize the knowledge field by bringing into presence epistemologies and ontologies of the global South. Um, I'll share one um, of the attempts um, that some teachers and I undertook in Pakistan, and I'm sharing both um, possibilities and challenges um, so that we can build on these insights. This work is hard and it's slow, and sometimes it's two step forwards, one step backward. Um, so I hope that during the Q&A, we can have a conversation around this. Um, so in 2015, um, I was invited by a community-based organization in Sindh um, to design and implement a summer teacher professional development program. Um, this organization operates in different parts um, of the province, um, and it facilitates the um, everyday functioning of what they call CBS, community-based schools. So the image you see on the slide is from one of the village communities where they operate. Um, during my conversations with the staff, um, I learned that many of these schools are actually established by international organizations such as USAID, um, but they have a time bound commitment. Um, so they come in, they establish schools, um, but after a predetermined period, these organizations leave these schools um, to the communities and so the communities have to figure out its upkeep, um, funding, recruitment and training of teachers, etc. However, since um, the rural communities where this organization worked, um, these are fairly uh, impoverished and ultra poor communities. Um, they couldn't really manage these schools on their own. Um, and so this community-based organization, which is linked to a Shia community, so it's a faith-based community organization. Um, this organization often has to step in to fill the needs of these schools. Um, they provide teachers with training, um, they help students with scholarships, they also um, raise funds for infrastructure improvement. Um, and so it's in this background that I was invited as a volunteer um, to come in and work with teachers from different villages uh, who were then called to the city for um, this training. Um, here are some images from um, two of these schools. They're in different regions on the left-hand side. Um, you see a school that um, can no longer accommodate the students. And so it has had to create these two makeshift classrooms outside. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a, a ceiling of a classroom um, that has caved in uh, due to monsoon rains. Um, and when I visited, the students were still studying in this classroom um, and the organization didn't have funds to um, refurbish it. And so I'm trying to um, give you a sense of the type of schools that these teachers are coming from. Um, now a little bit about my relationship with this community. So I have been working um, with this organization for over a decade now in various um, voluntary capacities. Uh, facilitating scholarships, but also hosting workshops, particularly for girls. Um, I grew up in this community before migrating to the US for higher education. Um, so the photograph that you see here on this slide, um, it is the building where I used to live. And I don't know if it's visible, but there is a, a red circle that identifies one of the apartments and that used to be my apartment. And so um, through volunteer work and research, I have um, tried to stay embedded in the community. Um, in some ways, I am read as an insider um, because I share the same Sinti cultural heritage. I uh, belong to the same Shia faith interpretation, speak the local languages, um, and I have a dense network of affiliations. Um, I'm there almost every summer. But I also um, now have access to social and cultural privileges that are not available to many members of this community. 
Um, therefore, um, rather than claiming uh, the status of an insider, I position myself as a well-wisher who hopes to improve the quality of life of members of this faith-based community. Um, so when the organizers first approached me, um, they requested that I review Jadid uh, modern um, ideas about children's psychology, um, classroom management and early childhood education. Um, those were the buzzwords at that time, uh, perhaps continue to be so today. Um, I, of course, had no expertise in these areas. And so um, I convinced them to let me undertake um, a different kind of teacher development, um, one that centered teachers' own knowledges. Um, they were, of course, um, anxious and uncomfortable, um, but they um, ended up giving me some leeway only after I promised that I would also teach some practical skills to teachers. Um, but it was this um, exchange with the organizers um, that clarified for me um, the continuing allure of Western models of curriculum and teaching um, that are read as modern um, and thus they're deemed worthy of study and of training. I hoped um, to interrogate this orientation with the participants um, to highlight how this view reproduces inequality uh, by conferring a lesser status to local knowledge ecologies. Um, and in this, I am informed by um, a decolonial scholar, Walter Mignolo. Um, he argues that experiences that emerge from the colonial wound um, are different than those that arise from the vantage point of empire. And so decolonial scholars in general call for reversing um, the gaze, they call for reversing our vantage points. Um, this was also a politically significant endeavor for me because as I just mentioned, um, these communities are fairly impoverished and um, they often don't have the funds to invite um, city-based teacher trainers. And so I hoped that um, by doing uh, this or sort of developing this praxis and centering teachers, um, we could decrease a little bit uh, some of their dependence on outsiders like myself even to come in and provide these trainings. Um, and so um, we wanted to create encounters and moments um, that permitted teachers to reclaim their own selves, their lived experiences, their geographies and landscapes as sites of knowledge. Um, I have published an article um, on this project which provides a lot more details uh, about the many sort of encounters that we created. Um, but given the time, I'll um, review a couple of them to give you a sense of this workshop. So on the first day, um, the teachers and I started with um, examining our collective, including mine, um, westward orientation or internalized extroversion. Um, we explored um, how we could figure out, uh, how we could reorient ourselves toward local knowledge ecologies. Now, local meant um, different things to different participants. Um, one participant, for instance, took local to mean Sindhi, um, and referred to how her Sindhi heritage was notably excluded from school curricula. Um, another student um, took local to me national and observed how uh, most of the books that they assigned to students, um, they had been developed under the guidance of Western consultants and um, quote, often featured people who look nothing like us. Um, yet another participant took local to signify religious interpretive traditions, um, and she expressed anxieties about the exclusion of Shia perspectives and Shia thought from curriculum and schools. And so this diversity of what um, constituted local, it created space for us to consider um, what colonization means in the contemporary moment um, and what decolonization might look like. Um, so a participant explored how um, classic colonial relations have transmuted into relations of domination across religious, national, and class lines in present-day Pakistan. One participant, for example, elaborated on how um, we could read present-day marginalization of rural populations in Pakistan as a form of colonization. Um, and as this uh, participant was making this intervention, another one added, and I'm quoting um, the second student here, uh, quote, those who belong to lower tapka were further victimized. So even within rural communities, there are then these um, loci of oppression that we have to pay attention to. 
Um, and so we spent the first day trying to think through these multiple loci of oppression. Um, we engaged with the notion of coloniality um, as a contemporary multi-layered phenomenon that both um, structured curriculum and teaching, um, but could also be resisted through um, curriculum and teaching. There were two specific encounters that we created. Um, the first one entailed um, forming communities of friends, communities of teacher friends, um, so that teachers could engage in self-reflection and see themselves as knowledge producers. Um, and the second one entailed a re-encounter with local landscapes um, as being generative of knowledge. Um, so having identified our um, internalized extroversion, um, teachers from different groups came together. Um, they formed these friendship circles to think together. Um, they spent the time um, redoing some of the lesson plans um, to address the multiple relations of coloniality that, that, that they had already identified. So one group um, modified uh, the Islamiyad lesson plan um, on the early years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, um, to include the perspectives of Shiad Ali, party of Ali. Um, and they included a discussion of notions of authority um, in Islam, uh, but also the events of Gabir Qum. And so the image that you see on the slide, um, this, is, uh, this is from their final presentation. Another group uh, of teachers, uh, they came together around subject area. So they taught biology in different schools. Um, they decided to include the notion of Tawheed or oneness um, in order to teach about human, animal, and land relationships um, through a lens of reciprocity and interdependencies um, instead of exploitation and accumulation. And so they were trying to teach some of the modules that they would often teach, but now this notion of Tawheed helped them to amplify uh, a relationship between human and non-human through different vectors. Um, other groups engaged um, with concepts such as um, collective duties, partikifaya, stewardship, uh, khalifa, ayat, signs of God, compassion, um, and justice. And so all of the groups were engaging um, with concepts that are lived for them, that are real for them, uh, and they're grounded in Muslim ethics. Um, so this exercise is it illuminated not only the power of collective knowledge, since they were working together um, without intervention from a trainer, but also how they could bring to bear their experiences of being Muslim, of living Islam, to the curriculum. And so Islam and its ethical imperatives then um, were no longer relegated to one course, but they could inform the study of social conditions as well as the environment. Now, um, I should note um, that the Islam that the teacher mobilized um, was a set of ethical and moral values. It was lived Islam, vernacular, popular, um, and less so a set of rigid doctrines or dogma. And so um, Islam here is activity, um, it is alive, it is ethics, it's every day. Um, and in a way, um, I, I think that this was a way in which teachers and I were rejecting the Islam of the colonizers, the one that uh, Noman just mentioned and Faisal uh, Devji mentioned earlier too. Um, and we were trying to perhaps reanimate a personal, a lived Islam. On the, uh, on the second day, uh, or this is actually the third or the fourth day, um, there was another encounter that we created, um, which entailed um, re-engagement with the heritage of Sindh and the Sindhi language. Um, this was because the majority of the participants um, were Sindhi and really wanted to um, uh, reorient themselves to an understanding of their heritage. Um, we were concerned about how colonial violence and the pursuit of a homogenous figure of the Pakistani, a national subject. Um, it had produced a distinct um, deprioritization of local languages and heritages. And so we explored um, the museum section of Institute of Sindology, problematizing the stabilization of Sindhi culture that inevitably happens in such institutions or museums, um, while also exploring its objects to generate new insights. So um, one participant, for example, um, noted how many of the artifacts displayed at the museum um, and representation of rituals. Uh, if you've been to the Institute, there are um, representations of rituals such as uh, what happens during marriage, for example. Um, she noted that they were no longer prevalent in contemporary Sindhi families, um, and hence the museum produced a version of Sindhi culture that seemed static as opposed to the fluidity that she herself experienced as a Sindhi. 
Um, at the same time, um, participants also recognize the pedagogical value of museums. Um, one participant noted that it offered an opportunity um, to learn about the tradition of gudge making and women's labor that goes into it. Um, she explained that she often felt um, embarrassed wearing gudge, which is the Cindy embroidery, um, to work uh, because she was afraid of being cast as backward or from the village. Um, and she also noted the intense policing of women's bodies where only particular sartorial choices are recognized as modern and reflective of an educated subjectivity. Um, however, after learning about the long tradition of women's labor um, and how the embroidery sometimes um, illustrated folk stories, she was able to um, develop a new form of attachment. Um, some other participants found um, the section on Sindhi scholars. Um, there's a, a section on scholars in the, at the museum. It was quite generative. Um, they were planning to then uh, form study groups and read the work of these local intellectuals. Um, the image on the slide um, shows a female Sindhi singer, composer, and social worker. And so one group decided they were going to actually do some research around her work, uh, particularly her social work. Um, a group of mathematics and history teachers converged on a vase from the city of Hala, um, and they discussed how it could become an object through which they could teach both geometry, but also the history of Islamic arts in their classes. And so I'm just providing these um, as examples of how um, intentional re-encounters animated a form of re-attachment. Uh, um, and such encounters with heritage and with lived religion may be crucial um, for us to launch a decolonial uh, move to reorient our vantage points. Um, it positions the life worlds of teachers, um, their ethical worldviews, their geographies as generative sites of knowledge. One of the uh, challenges for me um, during this entire project was to avoid um, creating artificial fissures and separations across knowledge. Um, I am limited by, uh, by language. And so of course, sometimes um, we would create these distinct uh, imagined boundaries when, um, when, as I mentioned earlier, a recognition of hierarchy within the field of knowledge actually means exploring connections um, because hierarchies are relational and they're intimately linked. And so um, we would often remind ourselves um, that instead of um, positing our efforts of curriculum making and self-reflection as, as radical departures from dominant knowledge regimes, um, we are trying to engage in a creative engagements with these regimes. And so the engagement resulted in understanding the histories and power relations um, that have marked local worldviews as inferior, um, and hence they place a responsibility on us to reclaim them. So during the um, workshops, we uh, theorized ourselves as becoming Hunarmand. Um, as you know, Hunarmand is an Urdu term. Um, it points to an agility that comes with um, working with one's hands, um, but it's actually often um, in our everyday conversations, um, and I write about this in my book as well, it's distinguished from being educated um, and, uh, and often used in a, in a pejorative sense. And so in calling our, uh, ourselves Hunarmand, uh, instead of saying that we are re-educating ourselves or being educated, um, we were also trying to um, politicize or interrogate uh, what it means to be an educated subject in contemporary Pakistan. Um, needless to add, um, these workshops represent um, one way of structuring a learning experience to enact uh, decolonial praxis. Um, several uh, similar different interventions are taking place across Pakistan and elsewhere within scholarly and non-scholarly circles. Um, I have listed the names of some scholar practitioners um, whose work you will find interesting to pursue. Um, and together this work um, signals a desire um, that we have to contest the universal voice from which the European subject of knowledge speaks. Um, I should also note that um, our work did raise um, some anxiety uh, among teachers um, as well as the organizers. And I did end up teaching a popular curriculum um, design module to appease them. Um, and as I was reflecting on my experience um, later on, I'm also mindful um, that I was able to undertake this experiment um, precisely because of the simultaneous insider-outsider positionality that I enjoy. Um, it gives me credibility with the community. Um, the project was also not tied to any donor funding. 
um, which meant that both um, uh, myself and the organization, we didn't have to report to a donor. And so um, there's a lot of leeway here um, that um, we enjoyed. And I, I share this um, to note that uh, a decolonial praxis that contests dominant assumptions about what constitutes knowledge, where is it located, and whose knowledges are worthy of transmission, it's fraught with anxiety and difficulties. Um, and so um, we have to be mindful that sometimes um, this work, um, uh, there'll be, of course, multiple challenges in this work as well. Um, decolonization since then has also uh, become a really popular term. Um, even the World Bank is now paying attention to indigenous knowledges, um, especially in relation to development in Africa. But if we just look at a cursory review of their documents shows that um, indigenous knowledge is assimilated into predetermined ideas about development. Um, I have listed a quote here on this slide from one of their websites, um, which sees indigenous knowledge as, quote, a resource that could contribute to the increased efficiency, effectiveness, and sustainability of the development process. So what we have here is um, a notion that indigenous knowledge is transformed into another kind of input into a pre-established development logic. Um, and so if it's uh, if indigenous knowledge becomes a mere add-on, a project of two in a broader portfolio without destabilizing the relations of power, then there is a danger um, of, uh, of the decolonial praxis losing its political import. Um, and, and I'll conclude by um, saying that in this context then, um, I suspect that our efforts um, going forward in terms of decolonization may have to take place either um, within uh, spaces where an authorizing environment already exists, such as was my case, or it could be taken up as um, forms of hacking or tactics. Um, and so De Soto describes tactics as minor points of resistance um, that are employed by the powerless to take what they can um, from the discourses, commodities, and spaces of the dominant society in the service of their own empowerment. And so perhaps a, a tactical decolonization within education um, may mean that teachers in their own context um, interrogate the dominance of Eurocentric knowledges um, by drawing on and twisting the very curricular models um, that are made available to them. Um, they can bring their lived experiences. Uh, in my case, it was informed by Muslim ethics and Sindhi heritage, but in other cases, it could be something else. Um, and they could bring these uh, experiences to bear um, to devise new understandings of the world around them and reverse the colonial gaze. And hopefully um, together these efforts then can provide the basis for building a coalition um, that has the potential to heal and repair um, the colonial wound. Thank you so much. Um, I will now um, stop for questions and discussion. Thank you, that was, that was very interesting and um... Thank you. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions which will arise. Um, I'm wondering, um, Norman, do you want to go first? Because you probably have a bit more understanding of the of the local landscape. Uh, I have a few uh, points, but why don't you go first? You need to unmute yeah, yourself. You. Sorry. Yeah, uh, to begin with, thanks so much. Uh, that was that was great. Uh, I'm so excited that somebody is doing this kind of work. Um, you know, uh, I've often been struck. I mean, not so long ago, uh, somebody who's more part of the post-colonial thing, uh, more invested in, in that, uh, resisted the very use of the word decolonial. There is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, in South Asian studies, you don't find the word uh, decolonial uh, used mm -hmm. very often. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's because they also just don't read what you're reading, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both Latin American uh, theory uh, mm -hmm. as well as African. I mean, it's, a, it's actually kind of shameful uh, part of South Asian studies and of uh, post-colonial studies. Uh, that these are absolutely necessary, uh, you know, both epistemologically and mm. politically, absolutely necessary uh, literatures and, you know, mm. people uh, that uh, 
we need to connect up with. So first of all, thank you so much for just doing this. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh. So some of the questions I had, uh, well, they're both questions and some comments. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, things of recognition, things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the what you say about, I mean, it's, uh, a, you know, a friend of a friend of mine and a colleague uh, uh, said, uh, you know, very well traveled across the world that, uh, you know, Pakistan is uh, uh, like the most colonized space, yeah, that uh, mm. uh, this uh, colleague had ever been to, yeah. Uh, and that, you know, I, I really feel uh, mm. that in fact, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of truth to that, yeah, mm. uh, that the uh, kind of uh, uh, discursive space, uh, sensibilities, uh, especially, you know, what you said, uh, the elite middle class uh, sensibilities. Uh, and I've just, I myself have had remarkable experiences where people from the uh, elite mm -hmm. over here in Pakistan get, you know, literally get outraged if you talk about colonialism, uh, if mm -hmm. you refer to that experience. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, first, uh, I, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I'd like to, you, of course, you've written a whole book precisely about uh, this formation. Uh, one aspect of this uh, formation, but I was wondering if you could say something more about that. So that's one. Uh, the other one was about the segue uh, of yours, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, you know you talked about that you know there's no absolute difference between European uh, knowledge and uh, other knowledges. Uh, so uh, uh, you know I've thought quite a bit about this as well. Uh, that this is a remarkable modern thing, yeah? That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, the moment you talk about, uh, the, the, I mean, it actually corresponds to what this new book that uh, Mahmoud Bamdani, the new book that's about to come out, oh, yes. uh, not Native, Not Settler. So this, yeah. as he's been saying for a while, this Native Settler thing is very much a, something that we've uh, inherited from the colonial period. It was a unique modern thing mm -hmm. that was invented really in the 18th and especially the 19th century, uh, this distinction, which becomes really a, uh, a discursive epistemological distinction. Yeah? So it's not okay. just, so it's both political and it's discursive. And this is, uh, you know, strange thing that we get into every time we were stuck in it. All of us are stuck in it, that, you know, it's a European, it's a, I mean, if you look at the past, you know, people were obviously much more, we are very provincial compared to mm -hmm. people in the yeah. past, who, as Shankar was also, so saying, you know, people didn't worry about, okay, this is Western knowledge. These categories didn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Western knowledge and this is Eastern knowledge. I mean, uh, it would not even have made sense to people. They'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. What, what, mm -hmm. uh, you obviously don't understand what knowledge is. Uh, you don't understand what being is, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a bizarre kind of thing that we're all stuck in. Um, and finally, if I may, just uh, one more uh, point. Um, uh, about this ethics and uh, you know, Muslim ethics. Mm. I mean, it's remarkable. This is just a, such an extraordinary feature of uh, you know, our modern life, that uh, of modern religion, that mm. ethics, you know, ethics and spirituality and religion are all separate uh, domains. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, it's monstrous actually. I mean, and it's really landed us in a huge mess. Um, that these things have been torn apart, which obviously cannot, they're, they're the most intimately related, what could be more intimately related to quote unquote religion than ethics mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and spirituality. And how could ethics and spirituality be two separate things? I mean, it's just, uh, you know, the bizarre kind of uh, mess that we moderns are in. So I'm really glad that you uh, spoke about that. Um, and finally, just this heritage thing yeah, about the museum, oh, uh, right. you know, I, I mean, of course, you, you know, and you said so and you, you know, did, did this exercise with your, uh, uh, with your co-participants, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the museum itself is a very colonial space. Right. Uh, it's a totally colonial and, you know, and precisely pedagogical. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yeah. Colonial, it's very much part of the colonial pedagogical apparatus. Uh, right. And you were sensitive to that, but you know, I mean, in terms of sites of heritage, mm. and this is my question to you: um, uh, sites of heritage. There's nothing more uh, uh, that's a part of that, and it's just remarkable the kind of uh, 
pedagogy that it has uh, provided uh, for God knows just hundreds of millions of people are these massive uh, poetic herbs, yeah? Uh, in the case of Sin Shajar Desalo. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, 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 and you know, even when we were talking with Shankar Nair, uh, uh, we were talking about, in fact, you know, you can see that in the past, there was much more circ circulation uh, b between the elite. I mean, after all, Shah Abdul Latif Bittai, uh, would be thought of as being elite. I mean, mm -hmm. it just goes to show you that in fact, elite meant something very, very different uh, back then. But really that's, uh, that's essential in terms of the uh, ethical, religious, spiritual yeah. education uh, of mo most people. And, you know, unfortunately, so, I, you know, I don't know Cindy, but uh, that's one of the great losses for scholars as well is that uh, you know even people uh, we who participate in you know the knowledge production we have uh, PhDs etc uh, but uh, really uh, don't read these absolutely essential texts yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know uh, in the case of uh, Sindh, of course Shajar Sara would be more than any but of course there are many others but yeah uh, so uh, thank you again. That was oh, just such a this great is, talk. a great question. Uh -huh. I will start with the last one. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, and Pitai uh, is, um, for Sindhis, in some ways, it's part of our everyday life. So we grow up, uh, like my dad would make me copy um, all the, uh, the different sort of um, verses, and then he would make me memorize, and then we would create these miniatures, um, trying to figure out, um, he would test me on whether or not I remember it just by looking at some visuals. Um, and, I, um, and because all of this, uh, all of the students and I, we were all in a way part of that, um, a landscape, Bittai would come up every day in every session. And so it was very much intimately linked with how we were thinking. Um, even when we were talking about Tawheed, Bittai would come up, right? And so you're absolutely right um, that, um, that even though maybe perhaps in, I have never written about um, his poetry, but I could recite <laughs> several verses. And so I think it's, it's very interesting um, around this distinction around what we write about, what we might teach about, and then something that we intimately kind of live um, in the everyday. And so um, he was part of the workshop uh, for sure. Um, I want to um, also um, talk a little bit about the book. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, as you mentioned um, in the book, I was trying to um, figure out, um, I was trying to follow this idea of the educated girl um, and how this idea changes over 100 years. Um, we move from uh, 1857 to 2015 to try to figure out um, where is this girl located? Um, what are the intersections of education and class? What is she supposed to um, know? Um, and then which discursive regimes are involved in producing this particular kind of subject? Um, and so the book um, attracts three different moments in the history of Pakistan, the, the turn of the 20th century, early decades after the political establishment of Pakistan. And then um, I did field work um, in, uh, in Southern Sindh and also Karachi. Um, and so I reflect on, um, on educated girl in the present, the contemporary formulations. Um, and one of the things um, that becomes visible is precisely um, this extremely narrowing understand, narrowed understanding of what constitutes an educated subject. Um, we move from a very sort of capacious understanding of, uh, of a, 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 a subject who is supposed to perhaps know uh, certain languages, acquire certain texts, but also um, have honor um, and be able to uh, have very sort of experiential knowledges um, to a kind of educated subject that we can first only locate within schools. Um, and then there is a certain sort of centralization of what are the knowledges that are necessary for that educated subject. Um, so, um, so I think this movement around how, um, and of course, all of these um, concerns are, um, are inflected by class interests. They're also inflected by uh, nation building that happens after the political establishment of Pakistan, um, because the educated woman and the educated girl becomes um, uh, one of the, um, it, she becomes a citizen subject. And so the citizen subject then has a sort of, a certain forms of 
um, responsibilities to the nation and hence is supposed to acquire certain forms of knowledges as well. Um, and of course, Islam um, uh, is pulled into this conversation. Um, sometimes we were talking about uh, what sartorial practices are going to be permitted for a modern citizen subjects and then other ways of being uh, Muslim and performing embodied Islam are then um, marked as, uh, as symbols of an uneducated subjectivity. So um, in some of the early documents from the uh, post-independence, um, there is evidence that people who are wearing the parda, the elite parda, uh, are no longer actually viewed as modern subjects, as ideal citizen subjects of the nation. Um, and so in the book that I'm tracking some of these intersections of gender, but also class and nation building, um, and, um, and tracking it in concert with how schools and mass schooling becomes the primary structured way in which we are going to educate um, our youth. And so there is a structural shift here as well from um, a landscape that was uh, that included different spaces of learning to now a landscape where uh, English schools of the past now seem to have dominance as the primary space of learning. Um, and then all the madrasas and all the uh, vocational schools have kind of been pushed to the periphery uh, and the kind of learning we do there is also then deprioritized in some ways. Um, and I think that feeds into your second question really well in terms of um, how do we think about knowledge. Um, I think um, one of the things um, that was interesting, um, at least in this workshop, um, was to understand how uh, there are ways in which uh, we, the participants, would make meaning around what it means to be um, a, a an ethical subject that was influenced by, of course, um, their understanding, their spiritual understanding of religion, et cetera, um, but also what they were learning in schools. Um, and sometimes the schools will actually not reflect um, some of the learnings that they might be doing in the religious education spaces. Um, and so I think um, what's happening here also is um, acquiring knowledges that um, emerge from a specific geopolitical and historical construct. So knowledge in the sense, if we're thinking about how is knowledge making practice happening, it has a history, it has a geopolitics of it. Um, and um, I've written about human rights education as well in this context around how human rights has become a universalist sort of construct, but it actually emerges from a very specific historical context, reflecting the concerns of a specific historical conjunction, right? Um, and so um, I think maybe one of the ways to think about um, these intersections is to think about um, the concerns that are centered in schools um, and their genealogies, and to then create space for other genealogies as well. Um, and I think that's what um, most, of the, most of the teachers were um, getting at as well when they were thinking about ontologies and, and epistemologies that they live with um, and how to find a space for those um, experiences within schools as well. Um, and I think the, the question around um, Muslim ethics, of course, um, uh, as Fessel Devji was talking about in, in a couple of um, sessions ago, um, we have really reduced Islam to an identity with a certain set of dogmas and a strict sort of um, historical traditions. Um, and I think that the notion of living, um, lived Islam, the notion of Islam as an everyday practice, um, that gets, uh, uh, th that um, in some ways, uh, at least when I, I had all of my teaching, my uh, education in Pakistan, um, Islam was quarantined to uh, one class, right? So it was Islamiyat. Um, it's only when you go home and in other spaces that you can actually think about Islam as an everyday experience. And of course, I mean, Islam is, um, is, is a lived experience in that way. Um, but I think what the teachers were also trying to get to is to bring that into the space of the classroom, particularly outside uh, the Islamiyad course, um, to think about how engagements with ongoing um, inequality, um, injustices, um, the rural urban divide that I spoke about a little bit, there was lots of conversation around uh, 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 divisions around tribal, um, uh, the caste-based, so they would call it tribal division, tapka-based division, baradri divisions, right? Um, and so they would deploy some of these concepts to also think through these ongoing um, uh, injustices that they experienced, also class-based divisions. Um, and I think um, it, 
it is helpful. Um, it was helpful, of course, for them to unpack it, but also the exercise was, okay, how do we now bring it to our, um, our schools where this, um, this notion of Muslim ethics, of lived Islam isn't really um, prevalent. And so I think that exercise um, was important. And I think it's hard work. It's also um, one of the things we were struggling with was how some of the modifications that they were making in this workshop, how they would be actually um, uh, taken up by their own administrators once they went back to their schools, right? So they were all from different villages and now they were coming here and doing this work. Um, but then there are other regimes of uh, uh, po policing, for example, uh, examinations. Um, you have principals that are also checking what types of learning is going on in classroom and how they might negotiate those. Um, and so this type of work then um, has lots of obstacles in that way too. Thank you. Thanks. And in fact, uh, kind of um, connecting to that, um, uh, this particular issue of, of the nature of, of education and um, uh, the instrumentalization of, of religion as an identity and as a, a set of assents to, to truth claims as opposed to live mm. reality on ethics. I mean, one's kind of um, minded to think of, of some of the debate of, you know, over while halaks. The impossible state that once this kind of state in Pakistan takes on certain prerogatives uh, and, for example, decides to call itself Islamic, mm -hmm. then it imposes a certain way of doing things, including education, mm -hmm. but it's incapable of dealing with the ethical, right? So, mm -hmm. all it can do, in a sense, is to try and um, uh, replicate religious nationalism um, in the educational system. It cannot kind of produce. Um, produce uh, useful um, subjects. And so uh, I, I guess my, my first question relates to this, uh, this question of, of the Muslim ethics. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things which is often said is that the function of, uh, one of the fun pedagogical functions within this rubric of adab, for example, um, in, in Persian societies was that um, through practices of reading, through practice, um, shared practices of understanding, um, you you became a certain uh, moral being, right? Um, you became a certain moral being, a sign of the divine, whatever. Um, someone who then would reflect the divine back would act as a mirror to your your fellow human, mm. and uh, that certainly was destroyed by the colonial state. Um, and it certainly is even uh, there's no vestige of that in the madrasas either. Um, mm. I mean. Uh, does anyone read uh, Saadi anymore um, in South Asia? Um, does anyone even remember why they were reading Saadi in South Asia? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so this this question of how you then bring that sort of uh, practice of reading mm -hmm. back, I think, is quite a difficult one, and it relates especially. Uh, it also relates to this uh, interesting um, uh, dichotomy you raised between, I guess, honor and and ilm. Right. So, I guess ilm is is what is written, what you study. Mm. Honor is what you practically pick up. It's like skills, it's more yeah. vocational than academic. And, and that kind of rebalancing then allows you, I guess raises the whole question of what is education for, right? That's the fundamental thing. What is the point of this? Uh, you know, we're not interested in just producing um, certain types of religious citizens. Um, and, and let's be blunt, in the Pakistani context, it means producing good, obedient Diobandi citizens, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's not about that, then that in itself is a huge act of resistance, right? Yeah. Um, now, what that brings me kind of to the second question, which I would have, which is then, how do you maybe relate that act of resistance, you know, um, living authentic to one's uh, you know, being as someone who is Sindhi, as someone who is, is Shia, etc., um, using both the language of uh, the idiom of, link, uh, of religion, but also one's own language. Um, how would you then relate that to other kinds of um, case studies you might have? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much work has been done on these sorts of schools more broadly in Pakistan. You know, what about a different context? What about, for example, a context in the North, right? What right. about a context uh, in a different linguistic uh, community? Mm -hmm. What about a different religious community, right? Yeah. 
and, and and that's where I think you would that raises this whole question, which I, I think the point that uh, Norman raised earlier, which is that decoloniality requires a much more joint up approach, right? So um, you know, it's it, in some ways it's pretty obvious that one resists a certain dominant narrative. But there are lots of people who would probably want to resist that dominant narrative if they thought it was possible, if they thought there was a space, the agency to do so, right? Mm. Not everyone wants this kind of official Islamiyat. Um, and not everyone wants this very uh, compartmentalized way of, of education in which everything else is completely oblivious to the lived reality of being in Pakistan. Yeah. Right? especially in the English schools. I, I have plenty of friends who teach in English schools in, in, in Karachi. And uh, uh, it seems that that experience of what they're doing is, is a bizarre bubble in some ways compared yeah. to maybe what's, what's going on more broadly. Um, and yet that is the bubble which is privileged, right? That's a bubble in which, for example, they're told not to touch religion mm. in any sense. You know, so even if you thought about bringing in, I don't know, mindfulness, which involved zikr, you know, I mean, nowadays in, in COVID, you know, all schools are being told to do mindfulness, even in London. And so a really obvious thing, if you're a Muslim, if you're going to be doing mindfulness, you do zikr, right? It's a very, very obvious kind of thing. Or you do some process of tawajjo or some sort of focus on, you know, on, on sanctity, etc. cetera. Uh, and yet that sort of thing would be unthinkable in an English school yeah. uh, in a Karachi context. And, and so, I, I, so that my second question, as I said, is about how do you build up those coalitions? How do you build up that more joint up um, decolonial practice? Yeah. And, um, and I guess uh, the final one is um, colonialism, as we've already said, is it's, it reifies, but it's also very slippery because it's always, always kind of um, reinventing itself, right? So it was a certain um, uh, British or English um, Protestant practice. Now it's become something slightly different and it's, it's changed from the 50s to the 70s to the 90s beyond in Pakistan as well. And that then kind of raises the whole question of what what is the dominance against one against which one is um, is resisting, right? right. Um, and I guess maybe related to that would be, would for example, is there a Ministry of Education um, uh, kind of um, uh, oversight, you know, of these schools? I mean, um, how are are there inspections? Um, does the state intervene in this? Do the, if the state does not, in a sense, it gives you that space to do a lot more. But is there, does there have to be a more active form of resistance because there is potentially inspection and intervention from the state in the running of, you know, in the way in which you might reconceptualize education and curriculum and pedagogy within uh, these particular states, um, the uh, schools, sorry. Um, I think that's enough. Um, <laughs> you know. uh, these are excellent questions. And of course, this is an ongoing sort of um, conversation. I think um, to the question around um, coalitions, um, I will direct you to, um, and the audience, um, Noshin Ali has done really interesting work with um, uh, teachers from the North. Um, and um, another, um, and some of the scholars whose names I noted, they're also doing some work in relation to um, thinking about sovereignty, agricultural sovereignty. And so I feel that there already are, and this is only some examples, right? Um, I, I think if we were to um, explore our landscape, then people already are um, trying to figure out um, some of the ways in which they can make education more meaningful to their purposes. That's why, I, I was, as I was reflecting on this talk, I was thinking about this tactical decolonization whereby um, folks who are being subjected um, are always um, trying to um, take what they can from the regimes of the dominance to um, create those spaces to breathe, um, to create um, ways to make meaning and still live, right? 
Um, so I think there is work that's still being done. Um, there is being done, and I think um, the coalition building is perhaps the harder part um, in the context of Pakistan, um, where you have um, a state that in that is centrally sort of um, and also private agencies where education has become um, so centralized, I think it becomes difficult um, to create those coalitions. Um, and I think that's the same when we look at Latin America um, where people are coming together, but I think we'll have to just do the work ourselves in terms of creating some of that um, critical mass of thinking and coming together and then pushing in different directions. Um, and then also creating a space where one could have these diverse, um, uh, diverse ways of making meaning, but also be able to align um, due to similar politics. Um, I think in terms of the state um, intervention, um, there are, um, a, it's a little, it's a, it's a bit different because um, there, um, there are schools that are community-based that may have certain sort of, um, um, maybe certain ways in which the state intervenes, but also lets them be. And that's one of the reasons why the community organization is able to influence uh, in the ways in which it has been able to influence. Um, and so I think maybe those um, liminal spaces where you're, you're dependent on the state, but not completely, um, might be spaces where one we could, we could start some of these um, ways to think. Um, of course, um, the religious education centers, as you said, I think the madrasas perhaps don't, and now maybe the madrasas are being increasingly regulated, um, but those could also be spaces that could generate um, a decolonial praxis. Um, uh, I think the, uh, the religious education centers that I attended were places where we would think about Muslim ethics, and those were um, really useful for me to help um, balance and think through um, the day school, for example. So I think there might be those um, avenues um, and spaces of learning um, that's where certain work is either already being undertaken or it can provide, I mean, we can create some of those spaces of learning, um, informal, um, where we could potentially do a little bit more work. But yes, I think the question around how do we do this? How do we scale this? Um, how do we then engage with um, the, the dominant regimes? Are these in relation to class? Are these in relation to English knowledges, right? Um, I think those are all important questions. Uh, thanks so much. Can I say something, Sajjad? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, so uh, thanks so much. Uh, this is uh, so stimulating. I, I wanted to take up um, a point that uh, you and Sajjad just we're talking about. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to use this as a soapbox, but I think it also has analytical value. Uh, the, um, you know, this new, completely new kind of situation we're in, I think it needs to, uh, it really should be emphasized and that's what your work is about, uh, uh, really. Uh, that we've created a completely new, I mean, the, the, the British with this Macaulay's Minute business, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, kind of pedagogical project they had, which was a racial uh, mm. pedagogical project, uh, racialized knowledge. I mean, this was completely unprecedented, right? I mean, no other uh, empire of the past, you know, whatever empires you're talking about of the, of the past, they never attempted a project uh, which was, okay, we've got to make these people will remain whatever, the, uh, you know, whatever in blood and color, but then they will have our, I mean, this was inconceivable to people of the past, yeah? So this was a completely new kind of project. And I think it really needs to be emphasized and it's very disturbing and I know people don't like to think about this, uh, is that uh, they created, you know, a really monstrous class of people, yeah? I mean, unlike any other kinds of human beings uh, who have existed in the past, yeah? So this elite education that you're talking about, yeah? And, you know, I've been through it, uh, I mean, I went to it missionary school, O levels, A levels, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, right here in Karachi. And uh, when I think back and I think uh, about my education, uh, I, re I really uh, feel totally empty inside, I have to confess, because, you know, I mean, it's a re it really doesn't give you anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one doesn't like to reflect on one's life like this, but really there's no, uh, and I think this is what Sajad was also saying, and I'm kind of hooking up with what he's saying as well. Uh, is that 
uh, it, uh, it gives you no form of cultivation, yeah? uh, of uh, spiritual cultivation, uh, cult uh, ethical uh, cultivation. Um, I mean, uh, uh, in terms of enjoyment, in terms of the kinds of pleasures uh, that you take, yeah? Uh, it's all this, you know, I mean, I just remember it was all this pop music, Michael Jackson, etc. you know, that, that, that was what it was mm -hmm. when I was, uh, you know, that age. Uh, it was just nonsense, yeah? I mean, just uh, the, so, I mean, whatever little education I have, really, at this point in my life, I've just managed to acquire by sheer will and against mm -hmm. a lot of opposition, because, you know, I mean, that's something that you continue to have to face. But I think it really needs to be emphasized, and I'd like to see what you think. It is an unprecedented, we are a new, we have to face this, yeah? Mm -hmm. And these people have to face this, uh, this class, that they are a new kind of uh, human being, which is really empty uh, and hollow and, you know, uh, tormented. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they can't have proper, we can't have proper relations with each other. Um, I mean, if you see Pakistani dramas, which are, of course, mostly about, uh, the, you know, middle class and upper middle class, uh, uh, people have terrible relations. You can just tell that, you know, the houses are, uh, our houses, etc., are just ravaged by conflict. Uh, and people just don't know how to have proper relationships with each other because they value all the wrong things, etc. Um, and the, in, the the remarkable thing is that scholars, yeah, uh, our class of, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, as a, uh, I think part of the problem is the fact that nobody will take this religion thing seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they think. I mean, social scientists, humanists, humanities people. Yeah. So this is that's the other great thing about your project. What you the thing that you've told us. Yeah, is that you know there's this uh, in the academy. It's practically part of the protocol that you're supposed to. This is all outside of. Uh, any kind of epistemological, let alone ontological investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah? Um, so I, I, I think it really, that's a very much part of the project. And it's, uh, you know, uh, and in Pakistan, it's really, really dense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, this, uh, whatever they think of themselves as being secular or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, this secular protocol that's part of the academy. That, that's very much so. Not only is the government system uh, or even the private educational system messed up, but even the people who are, you know, I mean, they, they go and they are ex exposed to all of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's all this literature coming out about the modern construction of religion, uh, etc. But it just won't make, I mean, people still say the most bloody minded things about Islam, uh, about uh, religion in general. It's just part of the academic protocol. Right. And the same here, right? I think being a religious, practicing religious subject is unfathomed in some way. Right? Yeah. But in a sense, I mean, that, that's true whether you're talking about secular elites or whether you're talking about so-called Islamist elites, right? So, um, I mean, this very notion of, of Nizam and Mustafa in, in Pakistan is a deeply secular idea as far as I'm concerned. It's also kind of nationalist and fascistic and stuff, but that's a different matter. Uh, but it's not religious, <laughs> as far as I can tell. It's not religious, it's certainly not ethical. Um, so uh, th this is uh, one of the classic actually things that seems to have happened in, in, in modernity uh, within various Muslim contexts is that you have this convergence of, of secular and I guess what you might broadly call Islamist assumptions about the world mm -hmm. in many ways. Um, uh, which is, is very much a uh, part of that. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to ask a, a bit more, um, I, I don't know if there are questions coming in. There is a very kind of esoteric question about epistemology and ontology, which we can come to. But um, um, if I can uh, ask you a bit more about, um, you know, you said that um, uh, because there wasn't a particular funding stream uh, so you didn't, have, in a sense, have to be accountable to, I guess, certain benchmarks which that funder might have um, have set. Um, and yes, that gives you a certain space. Did, but do you think that really gave you an autonomy of, of action, or is it is it merely, as you were saying, uh, uh, a set of hacks or tactical shifts? Um, um, how, how do you how do you open a space which is greater 
rather than just hacks and technical shifts? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's it's also hard. Um, I think that um, I did experience autonomy precisely um, at the intersection of the fact that there wasn't a donor um, that was involved, but also um, the fact that I am, um, because I have 15 years of work in the same community, it's the same people over and over again. Um, and so I think there's also an underlying um, relationship of trust, even though I no longer live in the community, um, I, um, I had a credibility with which um, they did allow me that autonomy. And then of course I did um, respect some of their wishes by actually teaching one of these very popular curriculum design modules as well. Um, so I think it may, um, I think a greater space would have to come from um, the grassroots. I think people coming together, um, people who have um, investments uh, in the local communities coming together and working together, um, um, and at, at least creating this authorizing environment, which takes uh, a while, right? I think uh, having these conversations is just the first thing. Um, I think the environment is created when you actually have somebody who's in charge of this stream. So for example, the, the, the director of this organization um, was a key ally. Um, and so I think there's a lot of um, work that goes into creating an environment, but I think that work also has to be done some way um, at the grassroots level. I um, personally, I think for me, um, it worked because they needed this training. Um, and I, um, I do gender and education, and I was somebody who is in a way also an insider, um, and, and there was no funding involved. I was coming by myself. I've written about another um, workshop that I did in which there was um, donor funding linked to human rights education. Um, and so we were uh, very much tied uh, to the kind of universalist subject that human rights imagined. And so I did that training, I was fairly young, and then I came back and I reflected on um, the ways in which um, doing that training completely erased um, some, of the, uh, some of the bargains that women, it was aimed at girls. And so some of the bargains that women make with patriarchy in order to even create spaces for them to breed, um, and so there is, um, and so I think donor funding, of course, influences, um, but then I think in this case, it was also because of the environment and longstanding relationships. Do we have questions coming through? I, I can't see well, them. These are both questions from uh, Oz uh, Ozer Ibrahim, who uh, is actually uh, a Habib University graduate. Um, I can't see you, of course, Ozer, but uh, great that you're here again. Uh, he has two questions, and uh, if I may, uh, can you see, Shunila? Yeah. I can, uh, uh, you can see in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, I, I can't. Okay, no. well, I'll read them out to you. Um, he says, can interdisciplinary thematic approaches in teacher education, and mm. therefore teaching, can mm -hmm. be seen as decolonial repairment work rather than having specialized subject specific knowledge creation. Hmm. If I yes, oh. sorry, yeah, there's another part. <laughs> there. Oh, actually, why don't you go ahead and then I can come back. Go ahead, what were you about to say? Um, so I think um, uh, I personally do interdisciplinary work. And so um, I find it really helpful to um, read widely. Um, and it has really helped me um, in terms of trying to um, think through um, certain problems and certain questions, but not from one sort of disciplinary lens to actually um, move about, read a little bit of affect theory and then um, think of um, aesthetics, for example, read Islamic studies text. And so I think um, interdisciplinarity is a way um, that allows us to think about the same question in a more expansive way. Um, I don't... Um, I don't know too much about teacher professional development in terms of the, the curriculum and how it works. Um, my sense is that um, at least here, um, when my students are doing in the US um, teacher ed, they do have two years of a liberal arts education and then they actually have a year of specialization. Um, so um, if we were to move in that route where liberal arts um, is your entry, where you're actually uh, taking a broader range of questions, then I think um, what is there, uh, I think that was the name. Um, I think that would be um, an interesting way to go about this. 
Uh, okay, and there's a follow-up question from, from him. Uh, he says, it is apparent that at the micro level, the discourse is much more vital and reflexive than it gets as you climb up the institutional ladder. That's, a, mm -hmm. I think, uh, that's uh, it's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you compare popular culture and folk culture, yeah. uh, there's such, I mean, in terms of the sheer intellectual abyss between them. Yeah, so on the, the popular culture, you have this Sheila Kitavani and whatnot going on. Uh, meanwhile, you know, there's Shajo Risalo, etc. I mean, it's exactly the opposite of the mm. way that, you know, we modern and, you know, especially middle class educators, people who call themselves, I mean, they're just literate, they call themselves educated. Yeah, mm. the sheer uh, abyss that separates them in terms of uh, intellectual depth uh, from the uh, folk culture. So he says, how might then we position the task of decoloniality as curricula in this particular community keep on becoming more and more dominated by Western academic epistemologies? And how does this further complicate the task of teachers and therefore of decolonial practice? So I think um, one of the issues is precisely um, around how this project um, often uh, raises anxiety as you, um, I think that's implicit, right? When we do, uh, when we question the types of knowledges um, that are centered in schools, um, and the teachers themselves were anxious about this. And so we, and I think the reason why we um, talked about tactics and doing these sort of micro forms of resistances is precisely because um, it was hard for us to, at that point, imagine how we might transform curriculum, right? And so I think um, one of the things would be to perhaps start um, at these micro levels um, to first create this awareness, to have an understanding, to work on this sort of um, ex extroversion, to identify it, to then identify um, how it pervades our, um, our everyday life, um, and then to figure out those moments and those spaces where we can work against it. For the teachers, it was in their own classroom space. Um, that was the space where they would start. Um, they were also, um, they were from different sort of villages. And so um, they were also going to stay in touch and actually meet every month. Um, and so I think maybe those are the very sort of minor steps that one could start with. Uh, okay, I think we've already gone on over and I mean we could go on you know a lot more and uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately we have to uh, close the program um, I think now uh, so thank, thank you, you so this much was really great. it was really wonderful um, uh, Sajad do you want to say something uh, no just to, to add my my kind of word of thanks as well um, I think um, I think what's really good actually about our session today is that um, to give so, sort of um, a certain granularity to what we're talking about when we're talking about very abstract things. So, you know, quite often when you're talking about decoloniality or decolonial praxis, it seems uh, pretty um, uh, sort of general, pretty abstract, and you really need to give it a bit of flesh and you need to give it some examples of how that actually works in practice. And and I, I think that's, that's what's really important because, um, uh, you can't do that decolonial uh, sort of work without doing that. Um, and, and of course, we've also addressed, you know, like, you know, recently there's been a lot of um, these weird kind of anxieties uh, about um, the decolonial bandwagon and mm -hmm. whether, um, you know, uh, things have gone a bit too far. Are we throwing out the, you know, the, the cliche, the, the baby with the bathwater. And, um, Actually, when you focus on the specific case studies and specific issues, you realize that that sort of critique is really missing the point. Um, because, you know, we, we haven't actually got to the point where we can throw the baby out <laughs> with the pot of water because, have you know, that's yeah. all we have. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got to create a whole, um, you know, set of, of priorities, social priorities about what do you want education to do? What do you want schools to do? What do you want universities to do? Uh, you've got to change the language about how you use it. And then only can you um, sort of uh, move on. And, and uh, a lot of it, you know, Norma and I have talked about this is um, there has to be a recognition that there's a problem. And unfortunately, there's still, it's still kind of um, annoying that a lot of people don't think there's a problem. Uh, so sometimes when you talk about decolonizing the concept of Islam or Islamic studies or the way in which we study South Asia, some people will say, well, why do you even need to do that? Mm. Um, what's the need? Um, 
and everything is fine. You know, just like let's do, do things the way they do it at, you know, Columbia or SOAS or Oxford or whatever, with a certain assumption of what that actually means, right? Um, so yes, thank you very much. That's been really extremely useful, and um, and and I, I see these kind of conversations and seminars that we're having as kind of cumulative. So mm -hmm. we're kind of building up yeah. a, a, a longer conversation, and I hope that. Um, well, we'll have to see how, how we get back to this at the end. I mean, it'd be lovely actually at the end maybe to have, I don't know, a workshop or a seminar, get everyone together in one place yes. and kind of reflect after the fact. And maybe that will be hopefully a reflection when you can actually meet and not just do it on Zoom. Yes. Um, but yeah, that would be that would be nice maybe if we do that at the end. Yes, Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah, yeah. Thank you so much for um, creating this space. It was lovely to chat and to also think through this together. All right then, Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz.